speaker is Sebastian Durian. Uh, so he basically is nowadays the executive director of the SCAL Center. He has recently finished his PhD uh, at EPFL. So he is uh, probably known to the Scala community for his work on uh, Scala JS. And I'll just give it, pass it on to him. So then he'll tell us all about cross platform language design in Scala JS. which I finished two or three weeks ago. Um, and so the, the, the whole topic is about cross-platform language design. So what does that mean? Uh, it's it's how, how you design a language that is both cross and platform. Um, so the language can combine and target several platforms. For example, the JVM in JavaScript, but also native code or Android or whatever. Um, but not only it compiles to each platform and it does the same thing on every platform, but also it integrates with each platform individually. So that's whatever I, com I coined as, as cross platform language. So, of course, I developed Scala.js. Uh, these files are made with, with, with Reveal JS. So you can embed the Scala.js application within it, and if I don't suck too much, um, we'll, we'll manage to see one or one or two stars at some point. Uh, there was a one here. Here, so we have is this this little game here, which displays stars. And as a running example, we're going to focus on how we display those stars in this uh, browser written. Uh, so with code written in, in Scala.js. So let's focus on those little stars. You can write some JavaScript codes that displays a few stars on the screen, or you can write Scala.js code that displays exactly the same stars. Uh, that is very, uh, very impressive. Um, so there are three, uh, three main axes to what I consider a cross-platform language. Um, one is portability, so you can write the same code, you can compile it to different platforms. Uh, first, it does compile to each platform, but second, it runs. And third, and importantly, it does the same thing. So it behaves in the same way on different platforms. Uh, otherwise, you can hardly write libraries that are widely used across all the platforms because some little details might, might not work exactly the same. Second point is uh, interoperability, which is once you're on a given platform, it's not enough to just make your language semantics or inner language semantics work. You also typically have to interact in some way with the other elements on that platform. For example, uh, on, on a web browser, if you cannot interact with the DOM libraries, which is the programmatic API to the, the visual rendering of the page, it's, it's all well and good that you can run code inside your browser, but it cannot you know, interact with the web page, so it's basically useless. Right? So every platform has, has their own specific APIs and their own specific um, features that you want to be able to access from your own language, otherwise you cannot really talk to the world. And the third thing is, while you do all these things and you design your language to support both of those things, it's better not to completely forget about performance considerations, uh, because otherwise your language might turn up unusable, but for a different reason, just because it's impractical. 
So I have two preliminaries. I know we're uh, at the SCALA Symposium, but at the same time it's co-located, so maybe not everyone knows what SCALA looks like. Um, what's perhaps less surprising, and maybe not everyone uh, knows what JavaScript looks like. So let's, let's just take one or two slides on uh, a few things and, and put things together. Uh, so this is in, in Greece and modern JavaScript, uh, you can actually declare classes now. Um, so you can declare this, this points class, which has two fields. So you define the constructor method. Constructor is a bit um, um, is a bit special. Uh, so it's the name constructor means something, and then you can just assign fields. And in Scala, what you would do is uh, for such a small data class, you would define the so-called case class which automatically gives you a few benefits like deconstruction and pattern matching and stuff like this. It's mutable, you can structure the quality, um, those things. So you can do something a little bit more involved and here is the function that builds the coordinates of one star. Um, so in JavaScript you can create an array, you would have an imperative like for loop and you do some complex math calculations, and then you create a new point, you push it into the array, at the end of the day you return that result. In Scala.js you would use a more functional approach where, where you create uh, an immutable range from zero until 10, and then you basically uh, use a four comprehension set that's actually a map uh, over the range that gives you another, another sequence with uh, immutable points inside. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing here is that the second snippet written in Scala.js, it has nothing JS uh, specific. It's really just your Scala code. So you can compile that either to the JVM or to JavaScript and it will do exactly the same thing. Okay. <coughs> so th what does it mean then that it's written in Scala.js? Or that well, it's written in Scala? At this point, it means exactly the same thing. Uh, it's just that code, I happened to compile it with the Scala.js compiler rather than the Scala.js compiler. So at the moment, you choose to instantiate it with the Scala.js compiler, it becomes Scala.js code, but otherwise, it's just Scala. Um, I often also talk about Scala JVM as the flavor of Scala that, that targets G the, the JVM. This is abstract Scala, it, it's really cross-platform, it works the same everywhere. <coughs> okay, so um, if, if you want you, your, your Scala code to actually cross-compile on, on various platforms, you want it to be portable enough that it's usable for a non-trivial amount of the, of the ecosystem, there are a few things that you really need to make um, correct, and correct as in do the same as on the JVM. So Scala has a spec that's mm, written in a way that looks like it's independent from the JVM. Um, the, unfortunately, the, the, some, some, thing, some things are left implementation specified, but turns out that there's, there are in a certain way on the JVM, and believe it or not, every single piece <coughs> of left unspecified thing will be used by some library in the ecosystem, uh, whether the authors know it or not. And so you cannot really look at the Scala spec and say, I'm going to implement that spec on a different platform. It's not enough. If you do that, you cannot even compile the standard library uh, and make it work. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just not enough. So you have to look at basically the, the de facto behavior that you observe on the JVM to really know what Scala means as a language. And so, so that's, that's what you need to really implement. So in addition to what you see in the spec, there are a few things that, in my experience, uh, you really need to have if you want Scala to go to another platform. One is you really need those arithmetic to, to uh, power 32 and to power 64 uh, when you manipulate ints and longs. There's, there's just no way around it uh, because libraries will use it. 
So if you add a billion and two billions, it does not give you three billions, it gives you minus one billion, two hundred and ninety-four, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you have to get this right. On JavaScript, that means you need to go through a few hoops uh, when you compile them, uh, things, but that's relatively easy. Uh, when you compile longs, however, it's less easy, um, but you just have to do it, uh, no matter the performance cost. It's, um, it, it's just, yeah. otherwise, you will find libraries that just don't work. Another thing that's uh, more funny is the Scala spec will, will try to shield you from a phenomenon known as uh, boxing, uh, which you probably all know about, uh, which is that if you have an int and you give it to an any or to a type parameter, it actually becomes an instance of Java line integer, it's allocated on the heap, etc. The fact that it's allocated on the heap is really just an implementation detail. Uh, it's an implementation detail with huge performance applications, but as far as the language semantics is concerned, it's an implementation detail. What is not is the fact that it's that an int is an instance of Java line integer. Like when you put it in any and then you ask Hey, uh, dear X, are you a Java line integer? It will answer yes, I am. And uh, this is something that, unfortunately, libraries rely on in both directions. So, both if you have an, an int, it must be a Java line integer. If you have a Java line integer, it must be an int. So, your language, no matter what, has to, um, I mean, your, your language, your language dialect of Scala that compiles to a specific platform needs to take care of this. And this is actually annoying for Scala.js in, in, uh, in, in some amounts, uh, but we'll, we'll get back to this. We would very much like not to, uh, but unfortunately runtime reflection is also pretty much a given. Uh, you need some of it. Um, this is, there, there is a small-ish list of things that you cannot get away without. The, some unsurprising things are object.get class, uh, class.get name. More surprising perhaps is Java line reflect array.new instance. If you don't have this one, most of the collections library doesn't work. Um, so that's, uh, yeah. And then there are something like 10 or 12 methods from the reflection API that you really need to have. And that is annoying in the context of, of Scala.js because Scala.js and other platforms like native which want to eliminate codes when they, they build the, the binaries, uh, we really want to get rid of uh, that code. And with runtime reflection, there is no such thing as that code. Everything can be uh, accessed in some way. Fortunately, the subset that we need um, is such that we don't we don't need to completely relinquish uh, that code. Uh, I mean, the, the ability to identify that code. Um, okay. Another thing is uh, structural types and their so-called reflective calls. Um, so, on their call, so if you have a, a structural type in Scala and you call one of its methods on the JVM. Uh, the compiler is going to generate reflection-based uh, code to access that method because it doesn't have a, a named interface to refer to, so it's going to use code that uses reflection. And if you want to support this in reflection, then, uh, then, you, then, then you cross the line where if you implement that amount of reflection, there is no dead code anymore. Uh, so that's really annoying because on the one hand, you have a very strong language um, in imperative that you have to support structural types and, and method calls on structural types, but at the same time, if you do it the same way that the, that the JVM does, then there is no dead code in your application anymore, and you have to bundle the entire library, uh, which is worth tens of megabytes of JavaScript code, which is completely uh, impossible to live with. So in fact, the structural, the, 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 the structural types, you basically have to rebake them in a platform-specific way in each compiler in a way that somehow you will still be able to do some kind of depth elimination. And this is a significant burden. Uh, just, just this one feature 
is responsible for so many complications. It's, uh, yeah, but but you, you, you have to do it, uh, unfortunately. <clears throat> and of course, the big one thing that, uh, that is, has consequences everywhere in Scala.js is you need compile time overloading. Uh, what does that mean? Um, it means that first you can define two methods that have overloaded names. Uh, you can <coughs> define the class string builder and it has a method advent that takes an object and another method advent that takes a car sequence. And if if you so in Scala when you call one of those methods, we use the static type of the argument to determine at compile time which one of those two overloads is going to be called. It doesn't matter that at runtime uh, the type happens to be one that would fit another of the overloads. It's the one that was selected at compile time which matters. <coughs> and this is important in this very specific example, which of course I showed it for, is that the append method that takes a car sequence actually delegates to the append method that takes an object. And we use this type of scription to say, please compile or upcast my S to an object to force the overloading resolution to pick the other one. But if you translate that to JavaScript in the most naive way, in JavaScript you don't have such thing as overloading per se in the language. However, you can do type tests at runtime, you can even test how many actual arguments were passed to your methods at runtime. So you can potentially implement all of that overloading at runtime. Except that if you do that, then you have to rely on the runtime type of your actual argument. And then of course, that example goes to an infinite loop, right, for obvious reasons. Um, so in fact, what we do when you compile it to a language such as JavaScript, which has runtime overloading, is you name mangle everything, right? So it's pretty obvious. People have been doing that for years. Uh, or decades. So the append method that takes an object and returns units will be named append underscore object underscore units in JavaScript. And we do that for every single method in the entire Scala application. So that's straightforward. It's been solved decades ago. Problem is if you do that, then JavaScript doesn't understand you anymore. So if if some JavaScript code has an instance of your string of your string builder and tries to call the append method, <coughs> it's like you're like oh, that method does not exist because I don't have an append method. I have an append object unit and append car sequence in it. So you've solved your internal Scala semantics of compile time overloading, but in doing so, you've alienated yourself, all of your JavaScript users. So you've uh, you've destroyed a little bit of interoperability with JavaScript right? because now you cannot really directly talk to JavaScript. So we'll have to find a solution for this. On the, on the flip side, a uh, few things that you don't really need. Uh, if, you, if, if you have a, language, uh, a dialect of Scala that compares to a different language is to, uh, or to a different platform, is it's not that important to preserve the exact uh, result of if you have a five, which is an int, and you ask it, are you a double? Um, Scala JVM would answer false, of course, because int is Java long integer, which is not Java long double, which is not Scala double. Um, so, but in fact, in Scala JS, this would answer true, because uh, a five, which is an int, is basically also a double, uh, because it happens to have a value that fits in the range of a double. If you have a 5.5, that would qualify as a double, but not as an int but five qualifies as both. Um, you have uh, other fun stuff like 1.5 uh, will qualify as a double and as a float, but 1.4 will only qualify as a double, not as a float. <laughs> and <coughs> the, 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 the fun fact here is that you can actually do that and not break uh, most of the, of the Scala ecosystem of libraries. And then also you have wrong casts. I have a list, and I try to cast it to a string. Uh, that's, that's, of course, invalid. You, you must not do that. But the Scala JVM actually gives precise semantics to these. It will guarantee that it throws a class cast exception. 
So if you write code that does this and then catches the, the class cast exception, you have started relying on the very fact that the class cast exception is being thrown. In fact, in Scala.js, that's not going to happen. Uh, in, in development mode, this will blow up with a huge undefined behavior error and not the class cast exception. And when you go to production mode, it's just going to do whatever because it will be truly uh, undefined behavior. And you can actually get away with this. Um, uh, again, because it's in Scala, typically people don't uh, catch class cast exceptions, fortunately. So at the end of the day, uh, who decides whether uh, there is something that you need to preserve or whether you can fiddle around with it and change the tiny bit so that you can get better performance on a specific platform or sort of things like that? You would think that the, that's the language designer's job to decide. Turns out, you typically don't have much leeway. Uh, in practice, the ecosystem of, of libraries that are published uh, on, on Maven and, and everywhere in the world uh, has basically made all the decisions for you already. Um, <laughs> because, as I said in the beginning, they do rely on pretty much every single corner case of the specific JVM implementation. Um, so so in, in practice, uh, when, when, you, when you design your language to a different platform, you don't really have much leeway to what you maintain precisely as this, no matter the performance cost, and then you work very hard to recover the performance at the optimization level, but that's a different story. Um, and there, was, there were only a few things where you can fiddle around and change, change things. Um, it's been my observation that the, the things where you can fiddle around are typically in the realm of program, programmer error. Right? Uh, a class cast exception is typically the programmer did something wrong when creating their program. And no matter how, how you think about this behavior, it's not a user, a, a bad form in, um, user input, for example. Or it's, it's really always a programming error. And because these things are programming errors, they're typically not reliant upon, right? Because they may have a bug and you would fix the bug, and that specific behavior of throwing a class cast exception will not be actually relied on. Um, so it's really with those things that you can a little bit fiddle around. So programming errors, behaviors, you you have you have a bit of leeway. Everything else, just just don't touch it. Right? Um, do, do whatever it takes. Okay, so at some point you have to evaluate uh, how, how well you did on, on portability. And one of the easiest things to do is take tests. So you can take the compiler and standard library tests of Scala JVM and run them through the Scala JS compiler, check the output, and verify whether they're correct. And so, so of course, we do that as part of our uh, integration suite. And the so called part test, which or most of the, of the tests of, of Scala of JVM. Uh, we, we classify them in four categories. Uh, correct is the test as is runs and behaves exactly the same way. Amended is it falls into these things where we consciously decided to do slightly different, and then we amended the test to test the different behavior. Ignored is test that test things that we don't really care about, like all the tests about runtime reflection, uh, which has decided that runtime reflection was, was not in, in, a, in the realm of Scala.js, so we ignore them. And then there are incorrect ones, which are bugs. So I have to, uh, to announce that uh, Scala.js contains one bug. Um, <laughs> so, and then, then you can do the same with the JUnit uh, test, which is test some, some of the libraries. You can also take uh, libraries in the wild, and so very famous libraries like Shapeless, Kalazi, or Cats. And those libraries, they've, they've integrated Scala.js into their own uh, uh, testing suite. So what you can do is uh, look at how many tests there are in their portable subset, the test, the, the test that they run and test on JVM and JS, and it does exactly the same. 
versus the tests that are only the JVM, so the test folder, uh, which you would guess don't apply on, on JS, they don't work <coughs> on JS for some reason. So we did that, and there we actually observe much better results than on the, on the compiler tests. The reason is that, of course, those tests, they test you know, real life examples of, of SCAR. They, they don't test this, this very specific weird thing uh, of, of the compiler. <coughs> Nevertheless, it's interesting to, to look at both. Uh, this, this is pretty closer to what portion of code existing in the wild you can just straightforwardly cross-compile. You change your build. You don't change a single line of, of source code in, in Redmond on JS. The other ones are for all the other kind of cases. OK. Uh, we've talked pretty much enough about portability at this point, so I'm going to dive into uh, interoperability and how do you manipulate JavaScript APIs. So this is a lot of code, but uh, it's, I, I'm going to, to point at a few things. So this is the code that's responsible for just instantiating the, game, the, the gaming framework of our, of our stars. Um, and we're using this library that's called Phaser, uh, which is a JavaScript library. It has a very specific API, it has documentation, and you have to use it if you want to uh, manipulate your canvas and do things like this. So in JavaScript at the top, uh, you would you know, instantiate phaser.game, give it some parameters, and then call some methods. Uh, well, that's just how you instantiate the game, um, uh, the, the game as such. In Scala.js, you can write pretty much the same thing. Um, you can use uh, named parameters to give a little bit more meaning about what this 300 and 124 map mean. Um, but then otherwise, it's, it looks pretty much the same. Except that, of course, JavaScript is dynamically typed. And Scala is statically typed. So the, the, se the second code box there, as, as is, it won't type check, right? Uh, there, there, there's no way Scala is going to let you instantiate phaser.game when it, when it doesn't know what phaser.game is. So what you have to do in Scala.js and what people also do for you for, for, for uh, popular JavaScript libraries is you write facades, uh, facade types. So somewhere else in your code base or even in a, in a library that you depend on, you will <coughs> write the skeleton of uh, the JavaScript library that you use, <coughs> annotated with actually as native and a bunch of other things, and and then you have a static API against you can um, against which you can write your code and the compiler can type check it. Um, so that that's what we do here. So it it looks like you're writing more code for declaring the types than the use case, <laughs> uh, which is kind of stupid. Uh, except that, of course, the last part, it's typically in the library, and everyone reuses it for every phase of application in the world, right? So it's not like that. OK, so it, it's good to have some, something that type checks. But uh, for most of us, uh, that's not the end of the day. Um, so if you're into type system, that's, that's basically all you do, right? If it type checks, it's correct. Uh, for, for, but um, uh, in, in general, you also, you're also thinking um, uh, much later, you, you want it to run somehow, and you want to understand what it does. So you have to, to assign some runtime semantics to this, to this code. So you can do that. Uh, you can add an appendix to the Scala specification, which is the Scala.js addendum, which defines a bunch of things if you have this shape of declaration in a JavaScript type, and you call it that way, it will mean this thing in JavaScript. And we, we use this, this double square bracket thing to kind of loosely specify recursive translation of, according to those semantics. Yes? Does the parent sheet that the semantics is preserved in the Scala side in JavaScript side? Because we already saw some examples that do not preserve. So here, we're really talking about, it's, um, it's a good point. So 
So this, or all of, of these things, apply because um, the, the object phaser in the class game, they extend directly or indirectly JS objects, or JS any, which is itself a super type of JS object. So uh, in fact, in Scala.js, you have two distinct hierarchies of type. You have all the Scala types that are descended from any ref or any val, and then all the JavaScript types that descend from JS any. And they don't mix, so you cannot have a class that's both. So at compile time, when you have an expression, you know whether that refers to a JavaScript type or a Scala type. And it's only if it's a JavaScript type that we assign its semantics according to this thing, which is meant to talk to JavaScript. If it's a Scala type, you assign it the, the, the Scala JVM semantics, and the compiler does whatever it takes to. to to preserve the semantics of Scala JVM. Is there any way for a JavaScript function to call Scala method? We'll get there. <laughs> so, so, um, so here it's in Scala JS code. How do I call JavaScript? Right? And and you you can do that. Don't do it at all. Uh, but it exists. Uh, it's pretty reasonably well specified. Uh, at least not any worse than the Scala JVM specification. Um, and, and then the, the, the compiler has, has, to, has to work with this. And then when you have the specification, you can look at uh, one line of Scala.js code, which instantiates phaser.game. And the first thing you do is you type check it. And in Scala, uh, type checking is not just assigning types. Type checking actually materializes terms as well, right? Because there is implicit resolution and uh, implicit conversions, a, a bunch of things. So the first thing you do is, you type check it, and that will uh, actually turn into another Scala expression, which uh, where names parameters have been uh, removed, and the, sub, the the resolution has added a call to, to I mean has records that the third parameter was left unspecified, so it's the default value, and then you can start uh, recursively translating the semantics. So what you do is you look at the translation of the whole thing. And then you follow the table, and you see that's a new. So you translate it to uh, new in JS. And then the class value is a recursive translation of this thing and parameters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you, can, you can do that. You keep, uh, keep following the, all the translations. And eventually, you get to this, uh, this shape where uh, the only peculiar thing here is global phaser, which is just a, it's not JavaScript. It's notation that I used to say, I'm looking up phaser, the identifier, in the global scope. Um, and it's never polluted by lexical scope from Scala. It's really the, in the JavaScript global scope, nowhere else. So uh, now we get to your, to your question. Uh, <coughs> If JavaScript wants to call you, then you have to also expose it, uh, expose uh, JavaScript API to it. So you can declare um, in uh, so in, in, in Scala.js here we have we, we this, this instantiate this game state thing, which is not a phaser thing. It's, it's our own thing that defines our own game, except that it has to extend uh, that that class state. From, from Phaser, so that Phaser understands it. Um, and it has a JavaScript API. So the method create here really has to be named create, not create underscore unit or whatever. Um, so you first declare the, the, those facets, and then if you want to write your class game state in Scala.js and make it extend uh, Phaser the state, well, guess what? That's exactly what you write. Uh, you write class game state extends phaser.state. And because phaser.state itself inherits the JS object, um, the, the, the compiler knows that you're really here declaring a JavaScript class, not a Scala class. So that method create here will be named create and not create underscore unit. So the, Again, this is, this is all really based on the fact that at compile time we can decide for each type whether it's a Scala type or a JavaScript type. Um, and so that, that it, it, I mean, it looks 
looks too big, right? I mean, it, it looks uh, pretty much a no-brainer what, what we did here. Uh, so why do we even talk about it? Well, the thing is, um, if you do define overloaded methods here, uh, then they will have runtime overload semantics. So if you write the string, the string builder class we saw earlier, and you make it extends JS object, it will run into an infinite loop, uh, the, 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 the way we defined it. But that's OK, uh, because there is no Scala library out there already that relies on compile time overloading and at the same time extends JS any because it's a Java, it's a Scala JS specific thing. So you're not compromising any portability here because you've, uh, you only apply this runtime overload semantics to the classes that extend JS any, not the one that extends any ref or, or any call. So that, that, that's how you can get away with it. And so again, for class definitions, you can follow the spec and recursively translate things. So you can have this class. First, you type check it. Um, you, you get a few things. Um, and then you recursively translate things. And you get this JavaScript uh, class game state that extends blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So you can do that. Um, but at some point, you have to ask yourself, uh, have I done enough? Like, have I defined sufficient language features, enough language features that I can, that, that it's enough to talk to any JavaScript library I might encounter somewhere else? And that's where we get to, uh, to a criteria for completeness, which, uh, as far as I know, ScalaJS is the first language to really aim for this goal. Um, so, uh, what, you can, what you can do is, um, so the question is, do I have enough to talk to any JavaScript library, including the ones that are yet to come? And I don't know what they're going to require of me as a user, because a library always has an API, and API is a contract. The library gives me some features, but I also need to comply to the contract. And the contract could rely on, on me required to do pretty much arbitrary things, right? Um, so how do I ensure that I have enough language features to cover any possible contract that any JavaScript library could uh, ask of me? And that, of course, leads to the question, what kind of contract could it ask? And there, it can pretty much ask anything not quite. It can only require the user to do something that you can do in JavaScript, right? Because if the library asks their user to do something that you cannot do in JavaScript, well, nobody can use the library, not even the JavaScript people. So, um, so that, that puts a bound somewhere around what contracts you can expect. It's a pretty large bound, but it's still a bound somewhere. And so you can aim for that. So if your language has enough language features to guarantee that you can do in ScalaJS everything you can do in JavaScript, then you're good, right? Uh, because there is no library that, you, that, that could demand more than that of you. So how do you know that you can do everything that you can do in JavaScript? Well, you go through the spec. Uh, you go through the entire JavaScript spec, and you go through every single construct that you have in JavaScript. You look at its semantics, and you ask yourself the question, can I replicate those semantics in ScalaJS using the features I have? So that's what we did. Uh, we went through the entire JavaScript spec, and through all these sections <coughs> that define all the constructs that you can possibly have in JavaScript. And then we uh, identified what language feature of interoperability we have in ScalaJS that allows us to enact those, uh, those semantics. And uh, here again, uh, you can see that we've covered everything except this one thing here. Uh, this thing is, is not supported at the moment. Uh, so that's, that's another limitation of ScalaJS at the moment. There is, there is an, if you want to talk to a library that demands that you use the semantics of new targets, 
in some way. You, you target, by the way, is a super obscure thing. Uh, I, can, I can answer our plan if you're interested in what, what it does, but um, that, that's beyond the point. Um, uh, the thing is, here, if a library demands that you use this feature to comply with their contract, you're stuck. Uh, in this kind of case, you cannot use that library right now. Yes? So, do you mean by Scholarly is in totally interoperability? I mean, for example, that um, uh, basically any of, of those things, right? Uh, for example, this, this, any of those, those boxes is, is one feature if you want to look at it that way. Uh, so, the, the top box says if I define a class like this and it extends JSN in some way, I get to create a JavaScript class somehow. Well, how is it different from JavaScript uh, language construct? So you have two columns, right? JavaScript language yes. and um, digital language. How are they different? Oh, right. Um, so the, the left column is really referring to a section of the, of the JavaScript spec. And in JavaScript, for example, you, you have a new operator and it has one syntax, and then it defines the semantics of that, of that syntax. And then the, the second column is, if I want to reproduce those semantics, but write the codes within Scala.js, what feature of Scala.js syntax and type checker will I use for this purpose? And in this case, I will use the new keyword of Scala, whose whose argument, whose class, is one that extends JSN uh, somehow. Okay. okay. So, given the time, I'm going to go fairly quickly on this one. Um, I said that we have two completely separate type hierarchies, right? That we have uh, Scala types and JavaScript types. But they're separate only as far as you can, one cannot extend the other. But they still live in the same type system, which means that you can have a JavaScript class with a type parameter, that type parameter being instantiated to a Scala class. And then that Scala class could have fields which are JavaScript types, et cetera, et cetera. The only, the, the only distinction is you cannot have a JavaScript class extend the Scala class or vice versa. This, this is completely separate. Um, but you can definitely have a JS array containing Scala points. And that's what we do here uh, in this method which actually draws the star. Uh, it calls the, the make star polygon uh, function which we saw earlier which returns a Scala sequence of Scala points. And the first thing we do is we turn it to a JS array. So now we have a JS array of Scala points. And then I can call map on this JS array which is actually the map of the Scala collections um, which will work on the JS array. And every time I have a, a Scala point, I turn it into a JS tuple 2 with X and Y mm -hmm. as the fields, and I get a JS array of JS tuples 2, which are basically arrays of two elements. So you, you, you can do that, and that's regular in Scala JS, right? Like, and you don't, even, you don't even think about it. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty natural. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna skip this. Build late on time, but I, I, it's things I have explained just before. I'm just skipping the, the, the slides. Um, so uh, now we've, we've basically covered what what the language level description of Scala.js is, uh, really. At some point, you need to compile it. And one thing that we do in Scala.js is we have an internet representation, which is uh, an IR, which is a Actually, its own language. Um, so you first compile Scala.js down to the IR, which is a language, and then you compile the IR to JavaScript. I'm just pointing this out um, because there are a couple of things that are worth highlighting about about this this internet representation. Um, so here is, is the IR that we get for the the game states class that we defined earlier. And that, that class extended JS object, so it's a JS class. It's not a Scala class, it's a JS class first. Uh, second thing, it has a constructor, which is a JavaScript style constructor. So it's a method whose name happens to be constructor. 
uh, which takes an argument and it calls the super constructor at some point. That argument, since JavaScript can call this thing, JavaScript can give it any val any value. Right? There is no type checker in, in JavaScript that's going to assert that uh, I only receive an int there. So when I enter Scala.js code from this JavaScript API, um, something that was typed as int in the Scala code can be given a value that's actually a string because I have no control on what JavaScript could possibly do with this thing. So the very first thing I do when I get to the border between JavaScript and Scala.js is I will assert that I have the right type so I cast my argument, which is in any, uh, into int, represented by this i there, uh, to assert at the boundary that I have the right type. This is similar to what you find in gradual typing uh, systems. Uh, not quite the same, so that's why I don't call it gradual typing, but it's similar. And finally, you can, you can uh, assign this, this validated input to the field and, and roll with it. And then here you can see that the create method, its name is really create, not create underscore unit or whatever. And then you can compile this to JavaScript, and that's a pretty boring uh, uh, aspect. But one thing that you can see is that in the IR there was an explicit definition for the field uh, store count, but in JavaScript there is no such thing. JavaScript fields are whatever you happen to put into the object either during the constructor or even later. Uh, so when we compile the IR to JavaScript, uh, we get this additional uh, contraption here that uh, creates the fields with the correct way. The uh, there are two main properties that, uh, that, that we expect from the IR. What's, one is it's sound, its type system is sound, it's a JVM-like type system, except that it also has interrupt features, of course, but the, the way we argue that it's, we don't have a proof, the way we argue it's, it's sound is that the, the, the JVM type system is, is believed to be sound, uh, and we have a similar type system, uh, so we kind of rely on that, and, and second, every time we come back from JavaScript, we cast all, all the time. We only assume it's any, and then we cast down and, uh, so that we don't have this interference with, with JavaScript and type this. Uh, so it's, it's very, very, very hand wavy. Right? If, <laughs> don't, don't ask me about it. I have some ideas about how someone could do another PhD thesis on proving type soundness for this thing. Uh, but so that's about, that's about as, as much as I go. And second, it's a closed world. So for, for uh, even if, if, it, if it interacts with JavaScript, there are some limits to what the, the interactions can be, and that means we can uh, assume a closed world and that code eliminate and stuff like this. I'm going to finish this presentation with a few things that are new in ScalaJS1, and then follow the, um, the methodology that we've had here. Uh, one thing is the, the global scope. Um, so in JavaScript, you can uh, you can write this this function uh, require uh, asset uh, that would take an asset path and would delegate to to the require function, which is a common, which is a Node.js function uh, to, to to get your asset. Mm, whatever. Uh, in Scala.js, you would think you could you could write this uh, as such, right? Um, uh, get to JS dynamic global, fetch the require function from the global uh, global thing, uh, and and call it with arguments. Except if you do that in Scala.js zero six, um, you it's translated into the, this this code and it gives you oh dollar g require is not a function, and the reason is <coughs> that in ScalaJS 06, JS Dynamic Global refers to the global object of JavaScript and not the global scope of JavaScript. So that, I mean, it, you have to be a JavaScript expert to really understand what that means. But to, for the purpose of uh, this, this presentation, well, the one thing you need to know is that in ECMAScript 5.1, those two things happen to have exactly the same members. 
if you found something in one, you got it in the other and conversely. So it was okay for ScalaJS to give you access to only the global objects, and then you could you, you could access the global scope through that global object. <coughs> Turns out, in a subsequent version of, of JavaScript, they broke that uh, environment. And now there are things in the global scope that are not in the global object. And that, for example, that required thing. And that means in ScalaJS, there, there is just no way you can use the required method like that. And that, that's a limitation that comes from the fact that we did not give you access to the semantics of looking up in the global scope. Um, and, and that means as a user, I'm completely stuck. So in ScalaJS 1, we fixed this. Uh, now it is dynamic global with respect to the global scope, not the global object. Uh, and then from that, you can look at the global object the same way you can do in JavaScript if you want. Um, and that has some, some implication. Like you, you can only access static things, but um, whatever. The other thing is, we can go on this. So in JavaScript, you can write this function make class that creates a class at runtime, a new class. And it captures this name here. So you can do that. If you do that in, in ScalaJS 06, uh, the compiler will let you do it. Um, but when you try to instantiate that, that class with, with no argument, it's going to complain because it did not receive the, an argument. Uh, but there was no argument in the constructor of foo. Uh, so what went wrong? Well, what went wrong is that uh, Scala basically in compiling uh, this thing, really fights the capture as an additional parameter to the constructor. That, that's what Scala JVM does. We had left, uh, so that's the IR you get, and I mean, uh, don't really have mm, enough time to go over it uh, at this point. But what you do observe is that there is this additional parameter with the constructor, and and there is there is none at call site. So that happened because in zero six we had left the um, the class capture uh, for JavaScript class basically unspecified. And uh, turned out it was was necessary to specify it. Uh, so in ScalaJS one we fixed that. Now we specify the constructor of JS class must stay as is, and that implies that class captures at the Scala language level must really translate to JavaScript class captures and not additional parameters to the constructor. That required some some effort. Uh, yeah, whatever. Okay, so it's basically ten o'clock. Uh, so I'm going to skip that one, and uh, I'm just going to mention that we have better performance now, <laughs> uh, but not look at all those graphs. And uh, yeah, that's it. Sorry, but uh, but mishandled the time. Uh, so oh, thank you. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> We have time for one quick question, and then we can talk to Sebastian afterwards. So, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, so, but, funnily enough, uh, we have quite a bit of experience with interoperating with JavaScript and other languages. I uh, hope one of the things that, that we find absolutely invaluable is uh, generating TypeScript as often as JavaScript and IDL. So, so, things like TypeScript or Web IDL. This is the description of the type complex of JavaScript code, and then using tools to actually generate the, the types um, for languages which care about types to give you an output for us. Um, so I was wondering whether you had anything. But we're, for, for example, some tools to generate those facades. So uh, the facades are typically we have a tool that translates from TypeScript. And I use the word translate intentionally because the result is not 100% correct. It's mostly a big eight in not having to retype the whole thing. Um, but because the type systems of TypeScript and Scala are different, there are things that even if you can write them the TypeScript way, there is a much better way of expressing it in the type system of Scala for this particular feature of that library, which was not even reified in the TypeScript type definition because it simply does not exist in TypeScript type system. Um, so, so most of the time you have to, by hand, improve them for ScalaJS. Um, and so, yeah, typically we use this tool as, as an aid and then we, people fix it up. And typically there are people that maintain various libraries uh, in, in 
the world for various jobs with libraries, delete the facades, and then you can, you can make use of that. Okay, once again, thank you very much. We have uh, the break now.